Tira, Professor, good afternoon to you, and thank you very much indeed for your time. We've seen both the ANC and the South African Communist Party being very angry at the claims by the United States. Do you expect the United States kind of knew what reaction they would get when they made this claim that our government had sold weapons and perhaps ammunition to Russia to use in Ukraine? You know, it's very hard to get into the mind of the ANC or the SACP because th their minds seem to bear very little relationship to the reality of the world. You know, it's not a fair world. Power is not equally distributed. And, uh, you know, when a, a flea fights with a dog, uh, if it doesn't bite first, the flea is going to come off worse. We are pulling the tail mixing metaphors of the world's only superpower and we must expect consequences and you know if we're looking at fairness and all the other kind of things then we shouldn't be looking at foreign policy the reality is america is still dominant and south africa is a rule taker and must take america and other great powers into account with whatever they do or don't do the way our government has handled this and it's worth just saying again that there's been no denial from our government if it wasn't true in the world of international relations and politics, and it can be complicated, would you expect our government, our president, our defense minister to say, no, the United States, it's not true. We haven't sold weapons to Russia. You know, there, it, it, I think there's a huge vacuum which leads itself to, to very dangerous misinterpretations, precisely because what should have been a, a fairly straightforward issue hasn't been handled properly. Just very quickly, there are three possible explanations for what happened. The first is that it was much ado about nothing, that the CIA or American intelligence got it wrong, and that it was in fact a harmless transaction that took place in Sinusau. Second explanation, the South African government agreed to the transfer of weapons and is now trying to cover it up. Third explanation, some secret element within the government or some private company, Danel or one of their associated companies, hijacked the process without telling the government. Those are the only three possible explanations. I think, obviously, from South Africa's point of view, number one would be best, and we can certainly debate whether two or three, which is better and which is worse. Um, it's, I mean, this must be a test in a way for President Cyril Ramaphosa in all sorts of ways. I think one, as Mouletzi and Berkey suggested on this channel last week, just in the hours after this came out, is a test on whether he has control over his own government. That's the one thing. The second is a test on how he manages a real diplomatic issue with what you suggest is the world's only superpower. I mean, this is something that has to be handled very carefully in all sorts of ways. The investigation needs to be handled correctly. And it's been said many times, Professor, and it will be repeated again, in South Africa it's very hard to keep a secret. Oh, absolutely true. And I think that's generally true. I think it's a very simple reality. What we've seen under Cyril Ramaphosa, which we didn't see under either Jacob Zuma, and that was for worse, or uh, President Mbeki, which was for the better, was a foreign policy that was coherent and was handled by professionals. And there's no doubt at all that in the interest of the nation, and it's a universal principle, foreign policy should be divorced from domestic politics. It shouldn't become a victim to interest group tubbing. Now, what we've seen with the ANC document and I think it's highly inappropriate that a political party should dictate foreign policy, is a very anti-American slant and a very pro-Russian slant. Now, that's fine for a political party, but it's not fine for a government, because there's no doubt by any definition, Russia is a sinking, declining power. So why the ANC is still attached to Russia is, is, is probably a mystery, because if you think... Soviet Union did provide aid to the ANC, was a counterweight to the U.S., but Putin's Russia is the antithesis of the Soviet Union. It really is, under the, the best interpretation, a right-wing, nationalist, semi-fascist, uh, kleptocratic country. This is not the kind of country which the Soviet Union purported to be, and it's not the kind of country that one would think South Africa would want to support. You could have been describing what the United States could be if uh, there's another term for President Trump. 
I mean, right-wing nationalists, some would say almost a theocracy under Trump. Absolutely, and of course he will be just as disastrous for American foreign policy as I think uh, the ANC is for South Africa's foreign policy. Professor, what do you think is going on behind the scenes? Are there a group of officials, uh, groups of officials on both sides, trying to damp this down, cool temperatures, have a meeting here, have a meeting there, there's a, a very secret WhatsApp group, end-to-end -end encryption somewhere, or do you think someone somewhere is trying to crank up the tension for reasons of their own? You know, one of the problems, perhaps, of what I would call divided government in South Africa, government divided between the uh, South African government professionals and the ANC amateurs. And one result is you get conflicting messages. So, for example, on the one hand, we have, uh, I won't say a rapprochement, but an attempt by Sidney Mufamadi and others to try and reassure the United States that South Africa is genuinely neutral. On the other hand, we have the ANC document describing a reported wolf of its doc uh, doctrine, and we have growing cooperation between South Africa and Russia. I thought the fact that Putin and Ramaphosa in the midst of the Ukrainian war would have a long private conversation gives all the wrong optics. So we have, on the one hand, sufficient evidence to show that there is South African-Russian cooperation. On the other hand, South Africa is speaking from another side of their mouth, saying, no, we are neutral, and we are still essentially against the invasion by Russia. And there's only one country that's been able to get away with speaking on two sides of its mouth, and that is Turkey. And Turkey has been able to get away because it has values to both Russia and values to the U.S. South Africa doesn't have a set of, if you will, offsetting values for the U.S. And therefore, we are likely to pay the full price for this, at best, we might say, incoherence, at worst, a secret sentimental support for, for, for Russia. And it's very interesting. If you look at Ramaphosa's proposal or his response, he doesn't define the conflict as Russia and Ukraine, which of course it is. He defines it as Russia versus the West, which is a total misreading of what the conflict is all about. Uh, Professor, I mean, I must just mention, of course, that uh, the president also spoke to uh, Vladimir Zelensky over the weekend as well, the Ukrainian president. Let me just sort of throw the ANC's argument at you, because what they say, is that uh, a unipolar world led by the United States is a bad thing. They'll obviously point to the almost unilateral invasion of Iraq and what a disaster that's turned out to be. At the same time, and it's interesting to ask this question, what would happen if a Ukrainian naval ship or a Ukrainian ship had had something loaded onto it at the Simonstown Naval Base? I don't know if our society would be in up in arms. And what does that tell us? I don't know if Russia would be up in arms in the way that the U.S. is. It's absolutely correct. The United States has made a vast number of errors. The United States uh, doesn't practice what it preaches. Uh, I would certainly not sit here and complain or, com or maintain that the U.S. is a model of probity and rationality. But in this case, it's fairly unambiguous. Uh, Russia attacked the Ukraine despite assuring the world that it had no intention and despite the fact that the Russians had signed an agreement with Ukraine that they would respect its borders. And it's very interesting that former President Clinton says that as early as 2004, long before serious issues of Crimea and uh, NATO, that Putin had told Clinton he doesn't accept the Russian agreement to respect Ukraine's borders because it was a discredited President Yeltsin, and also, he says, it didn't go through various legal processes. So I think it's quite clear that while we can argue and make a strong case that America, to some extent, as the uni power, arrogant power, disrespected Russia, that they expanded NATO and so on, but even if we accept that there was provocations, there is absolutely no justification in law, in morality or in geopolitics to see the conflict as other than Russia versus Ukraine, not Russia versus the West. Professor Robert Chirp, thank you. Emeritus Professor in the Department of Political Studies at the University of Cape Town. Really do appreciate the time.